now we will be proceeding to our first technical session and the first technical session of today's webinar is on industry perspectives on fish processing and value addition for this we have with us shriti and venu gopalan sir business development manager at mass messers coaching frozen foods arur alakuza kerala we welcome you sir the session is over to you good morning today i'm going to do, tell you a story about the seafood industry I joined this industry in way back in 1985 as a technologist. Over the past three and a half decades, many changes have taken place in the industry. It has gone through many ups and downs. It has seen the growth and development of a million dollar industry. In fact, fish, we have been consuming fish from time immemorial and fishing has been going on for centuries. It is all at a subsistence levels. It's a livelihood fishing, just as an occasion. Organized fishing or commercial fishing started in India only in the 1960s. Till then, we were using our traditional fishing craft and gear, and fishing was going on as usual. The commercial fishing in India was heralded by a joint venture between the government of India and Norwegian government. What is called into Norwegian project, INP, which later became Integrated Fisheries Project, which in actually is the forerunner of today's NIFAT. Till the 1960s, there was no seafood export from India. Whatever we harvested, we used to consume in the domestic market. And unfortunately, more than 50% of the catch were either wasted or used for curing, salting, all those things. The industry came into being in the early 60s and the first company to venture into this export trade was a company in Cochin called Cochin Company. One Mr. Madhavan Nair, he sent one consignment of prawn pulp to Rangu in Burma, what is today's Myanmar. Actually this, you know, prawn pulp, in Malayalam we call this Chemi paripur. Actually, it is shim, which is cooked. After cooked, the shells are removed and then it is dry. It's a very tasty uh, food item. It was the first product which we exported from India. <clears throat> Later, other a uh, few other entrepreneurs also entered the export trade, and the business started slowly and uh, started picking up momentum. But by early seventies. Many people have started uh, rationalization in the industry. Instead of the pulp, our entrepreneurs came to know about the emerging technology in food processing. And thus came into being what is called canning. You know what is canning? A canned product, which is actually a cooked product, fish or shrimp, whatever it is, which is kept uh, sealed in an aseptic container called a can. There are many advantages for canned product and like other, other products because first of all, it is ready to use. Once, if you want, you just open the can and you can eat it. It is uh, usually canned in a, in a medium, a liquid medium, either brine or oil or tomato sauce. There are so many other mediums. So thus, canning industry came into existence in India and people started uh, exporting canned products. As I said, the, 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 the beauty of the canned product is one is it is ready to eat and second thing it is shelf stable you can keep the product at under ambient temperature for nearly two years no need for any mechanical refrigeration only or any store so these are the advantages so what happened once we started this business in india there was a ready market in overseas countries but later what happened you know, all the, these cans we were importing from other countries like European countries, like Norway and all. But gradually, what happened? The cost of these cans became exorbitant. It increased so much so that the cost of the can became more costlier than the product itself. For example, if you buy a can of canned tuna for uh, rupees 25 or 30, the cost of the can will be more than 15 rupees. So it is not economical. Under these circumstances, a, a few of these 
uh, enter early entrepreneurs started uh, they started uh, probing about emerging technologies like freezing freezing actually what we are doing is freezing the product in a freezer there are two kinds of freezers one is plate freezer where we can freeze the product into blocks a 2 kilo or 4 kilo like that this is mainly for items like shrimps cuttlefish small small items and for large fish items we have tunnel or air blast freezer whatever be the type of freezer we freeze at a temperature of minus 40 degrees celsius till the water free water in the product is fully frozen then the frozen product is taken out of the product freezer packed it and kept it in a cold storage which is maintained at minus 18 degrees celsius and till the product is delivered to the end customer we have to keep the cold chain that is most important thing so in the early 80s when i came into this field what we were doing is in those days export business was concentrating and focusing only on shrimps there were a number of shrimp product like uh, white tiger bubal and caricature so many shrimps which we exported in block form in different types like headless shellon peeled peeled divine all those things all in block normally two book two kilo block and the main markets were us and japan and some european countries also so these blocks were packed in 20 kilo cartons that is one carton means 20 kilo of block and frozen block shrimp or whatever it is and in those days we used to take the product when one consignment is ready we will take the product in insulated trucks in those days in refrigerated trucks were not available so once the consignment is ready one consignment is around 20 metric ton that is 1000 cartons so when one container is ready we will take the products in three trucks and we will take to Cochin port where the vessel will be waiting for us. So in the vessel, there are huge cold stores. So we will stuff this in a very laborious way into the, the store of the ship. This is what is going on. So apart from us, there were so many different companies, tens of hundreds of companies, companies will be there for stuffing. So it is a very uh, tight situation. Sometimes we will have to wait for say 10 to 12 hours for our tent to stuff the container. And the sad part of the story is that sometimes we may not get enough space in the ship. Suppose we take 100, 1000 cartons, we may be able to stuff only 800 or 900. Then what we will do? We are forced to bring back the remaining cargo to the factory and keep it in the store. This is called what was called shut out cargo. In those days, there were, in the initial days, there were no strict quality control. Anyone can export as we like. Then st complaints started coming from the importers. So the government of India introduced compulsory pre-shipment inspection for export commodities. So what the exporter is doing is he will take order, he will prepare one cargo, and once the consignment is ready, he will approach Central Institute of Fisheries Technology, CFT. CIT of the first nodal agency for quality control. So the scientists from CFT will come and inspect the product. This was going on as when more and more people came into the export scenario. This, uh, this type of quality control proved ineffective because we are checking the final product. If anything goes wrong with the product, the entire consignment will get rejected. So the government of India constituted a special a body called Export Inspection Council of India and brought all marine product meant for export under the Inspection and Quality Control Act of 1965. So this was a landmark development. So once this was introduced, all the consignments were uh, inspected by the officers of the inspection agency and then we, they will issue a certificate. If the product is uh, safe and export worthy, they will issue a certificate. Even then, 
uh, problems continue to occur in the importing countries. So what the government did, they introduced another scheme called in process quality control. So in this, uh, in the EIA testing, they are only testing the end product. So there is always a risk. There is the risk of a, a good quality material getting rejected. And similarly, there is also the risk of a, uh, an inferiority quality, quality product getting passed because we are uh, depending on a few samples. So it is not a safe method. So later in the 70s, the government introduced IPQC or in process quality control. Under this pro quality program, each exporting company should be equipped with a laboratory, a well equipped laboratory capable of conducting organoleptic, physical, uh, chemical and bacteriological analysis of seafood product. And side by side with this, EAA has uh, given detailed quality specifications for each parameter. And not only the laboratory, each exporting unit was required to appoint one qualified person as technologist. This technologist should have minimum qualification of an MSE and uh, three months experience in a lab or some training conducted by institutes like CIFT or NPDA or EAA. Apart from this, the technologist has to get approved. His competency in conducting these tasks is assessed by a panel of experts, including people from uh, EAA, NPDA, one expert from CIFT, and also a representative of the trade. This was the thing. So what happened here, the entire product is we are checking, but in process quality control. We will check raw material, we will check in process material, we will check finished product. So what happened, once this uh, system became uh, fully functioning, there was no rejection at destination. There was no end product rejection because we are rejecting the process, uh, product then and there. For example, if the material, raw material is uh, deteriorated or if it is not up to the quality, we will reject the, the receiving stage itself. So this enabled in creating confidence among the buyers. This is the quality scenario. And side by side with this development in the logistic side also, many changes have taken place. The most important one is containerization. So instead of taking the product to the share port and stuffing by manual workers into the hold of a ship, we can take refrigerated container. So this, that was also a landmark development, which enabled the logistics to different destinations in a much easier way. Now we have refrigerated container of 40 foot size and 20 foot size where we can adjust the temperature at preset temperature. We, as per our request, it can be either minus 18, minus 20, or minus 21. We, that we, they will, the container uh, agency will set. So this was also a landmark development in the logistics side. And in the quality front, even after the introduction of IPQC, problems started coming. Later, the government of India, in consultation with other stakeholders like CIFT and EMPADA conducted detailed studies and with recommendations from US, FDA and the European Union, the government of India in 1985 enacted the Quality Control in and Monitoring Act of 1985, which is based on what is called Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point or HACCP based Food Safety Management System, FSMS. Here, what we are doing is we uh, see in advance what are the likely uh, food safety problems which are likely to occur in a product. We never wait for a problem to occur in the product. Instead, we act, we, we uh, act in a proactive manner. We decide, okay, such and such problems can occur in this problem of the product. And then what we do, we take preventive measures in advance so that the problem never occurs. For example, in uh, cultured shrimps, antibiotic is a problem. So what we do, this, this is a hazard. So what we do, we take preventive measures like checking the samples 
in the farm, vendor certification, all those things to ensure that the shrimp coming into our factory is of good quality and there is no uh, antibiotic contaminant. Similarly for fishes, for example, um, histamine formation, which is a serious problem in uh, histamine forming fishes like tuna, mackerel, all those fishes side. So what we do, each load upon re receipt in the factory, we will check for histamine content. If the histamine content is above the prescribed limit, we will reject the product then and there. So this kind of inspection enable the importers to build up confidence. So containerization of the coming of refrigerated containers on one side and the introduction of a quality management system manned by quality people enable us to put the industry on par with many of the well-developed countries like European Union and USA. Now coming to the Indian side, at present from India, we are exporting marine products in seven different categories. They are frozen seafood, fresh or chilled seafood, canned seafood, dried seafood, freeze-dried seafood, live seafood, and ornamental fishes. And as we know, major portion of the export is by frozen form. Frozen fish is the frozen seafood is the uh, major chunk of the export from India. Here also, during the past uh, 20 years, a lot of uh, innovation has taken place. Instead of the earlier method of block freezing, now we have adopted IQ freezing, what is called individually cooked frozen product, where individual shrimps are frozen, just like cashew nuts. So if you want, you can buy 100 gram packet or 200 gram packet. You just put in water, okay, it will be ready for uh, cooking. Or if you want, you can buy cooked shrimps. You just eat and eat. This kind of IQ of product has opened up new avenues for Indian product in overseas market. As of now, we have 640 merch manufacturer exporters in India. A manufacturer exporter means an exporter, seafood exporter, who owns a processing plant or a factory, or he has a factory of his own. We have such 640 manufacturer exporters in India, and we have 548 merchant exporters. Merchant exporters are those exporters who do not have a factory of their own, but they utilize the facility of other manufacturing company, manufacturers. So there are 548 merchant exporters and another 104 route through exporters. These are mainly export houses and start trading houses and 45 ornamental fish exporters. So altogether we have 1,337 exporters at present. Now, the major portion or the lion's share of the export from India is frozen shrimp. We get frozen shrimp from two sources. One is from the marine sources like uh, white shrimp, brown shrimp, what is called puwal and karikadi, nar, and all those she shrimp. And the other is cultured shrimp, what is called Pacific white shrimp or what is called vanamai shrimp. Till 1980s, in the late of 1980s, we were depending solely on our marine resources for export purpose. So what happened over the years, there were more and more fishing craft entered the fleet with modern fish catching equipments and advanced fishing crafts and gear. And they started over exploitation of the resources. So over the years, after the 80s, our marine resources started declining. This is mainly due to one is over exploitation. Second thing is this bottom troll is causing tremendous and irreparable damage to the seafloor. And also this uh, global warming and associated phenomena like uh, ocean acidification. These are all playing havoc with the survival and robustness of our 
most of the commercial fisheries. So by after 1980s, we started culture of one of my shrimp in a small way. And at the, at the, in the beginning, there were a lot of objections from the trade and from the environmentalists because uh, this is a, uh, an alien species which we are going to culture here. So we conducted a lot of studies, organizations like uh, EMPADA, CMFRA, CIFT, NIFAT, all these associ trade associations, all these uh, organizations together conducted studies. And after the successful completion of the studies, we introduced Vanamai on its commercial scale. Now, if you go to Antra, Antra is the uh, nerve center of Vanamai farming. Around 70, 75% of the Vanamai stream we are getting from Andhra region, especially in the Lur, in the Lur and Bhimavaram. But slowly, and slowly but steadily, the culture of shrimp is uh, extending to other states also. For example, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, all other states are also coming. So when more and more cultured shrimp comes, our dependence on uh, wild caught shrimp will decrease. And this will provide chance for the wild shrimp uh, to reju rejuvenate. Now let us see which are the uh, items we export. As I said, uh, shrimp is the main item. Uh, during 2018-19, we exported 13,92,559 metric ton of frozen seafood from India, which is valued at 6,728.50 million US dollars, which is actually 0.74% less than the previous year figure. In quantity wise also, there is a 7% decline. The reasons I will tell you later. So even now, the mainstay of the export trade is shrimps, frozen shrimps, block frozen shrimps, IQ shrimps, now, a few companies have come, come up with world-class facilities like for making breaded shrimps. All these products have a ready market in European Union countries, then uh, US and Russia. Russia is a uh, very lucrative market for uh, Indian seafood. And we get a very good price also. Price realization is also very attractive, but because of the very stringent quality parameters of Russian uh, Russia, most of the exporters are not ready to export to Russia, even though we get a lucrative price. This is the reason. Even regulatory agencies are not uh, promoting or encouraging export because uh, their quality parameters are very difficult to meet. Most of them are impractical. That's the reason. So after uh, shrimps, the next important item of export is frozen, uh, sorry, fish, fishes, which is uh, exported in two ways, as frozen fish and also as fresh chilled fish. The important fish we export are yellowfin tuna, skipjack, swordfish, mahi-mahi, grouper, snapper, sea fish, palm fried, ribbon fish, leather jacket, Indian mackerel, Japanese threadfin bream, anchovies, Indian oil sardine, scad, lizard fish, and such other things. And interestingly, there is a thriving market for these Indian fishers in UK and USA. You know, most of these products are going for ethnic cooperation. As you know, in UK and the US, there is a growing population of Indian people. So all, most of these pro products are going for, for the ethnic population. And most of them bear our uh, Deshi labels. Some, in some uh, packets, you can see written uh, product name written in Malayalam and Tamil. So it is for the ethnic population. So these are the main fish items which we export at present. Then comes cephalopods like cuttlefish, squid and octopus. Till 1980, 81, 80s, there was no export of cuttlefish. 
it was till then our full concentration was on shrimps and some fishes even though we used to get cuttlefish there was no ready market so the government intervened and the the government of the day provided subsidy for exporters who are ready to export cuttlefish so this is a an incentive for others for other exporters so gradually more and more exporters came into this field and started uh, exploiting these cephalopods and wow, one thing we must understand is that apart from fin fishes there is no domestic farm market for these fishes for example shrimps we have only a very limited market in the domestic sector and cuttlefish squid octopus there is no market at all or if at all there is a market it is a mega so that is the relevance of export market if there is no export market all these products including shrimps and cephalopods will suffer so that that is the there is a need for exploiting these resources and exporting to overseas destinations because we do not have a ready domestic market and this is the uh, growth of the uh, seafood industry during the past 30 years during this period the industry has gone through many ups and downs now let us see some of the challenges faced by the industry right now we are in the midst of a serious problem covid 19 just like all other uh, all other uh, 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 sphere of human life seafood industry is also worse hit because there was sudden uh, collapse of market there is no raw material there was lockdown all over india extending to months together all these have seriously impacted the seafood industry and even now we are all struggling to come out of the situation now i will tell this uh, tell you some of the challenges which the industry is facing facing now one is the scarcity of raw material as i said in the marine sector the catch is going down 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 year after year it's going down for example i will tell you a figure give you a figure our marine fish production in 2019 20 was 3.72 million metric ton and in the same year inland fish production especially when i might uh, aquaculture was 10.43 million metric ton so wild catch is 3.72 and uh, uh, inland production is 10.43 to just contrast this figure with what was available in, during the turn of the century that is in 2000 2001 marine fish production was 2.8 million metric ton so from 2.8 million we reached 3.7 it's not any not much increase almost stagnating but so you see the uh, culture production inland fish production in 2000 2001 marine fish production was 2.8 million metric ton inland production was also 2.8 million metric ton almost 50 50 but last year inland fish production was to the tune of 10.43 million metric ton that is now the situation has changed marine fish production is less than 26% and inland production has come up to 77% so this is the a figure available that means the marine fish production is almost stagnating and on the one other side on the market demand side the demand for marine seafood is increasing day by day so there is scarcity of raw material coupled with stiff competition for uh, prices cut cut throat competition that is one problem the another problem we encounter now is the sudden collapse of all the major markets like spain italy greece and germany in europe us and asian countries due to covid because they cannot operate they cannot open their factory lockdown uh, disruption of uh, supply chain all those things are seriously impacted then increased cost of production 
because of uh, this uh, pandemic we cannot operate as we used to do because we have to follow the covid appropriate behavior so we have to restrict the number of workers instead if now we employ hardly one third of the workers so what happens the production is suffering it is not moving as it used to be it is all adding to our cost of production. Another problem is the exorbitant increase in ocean freight. After COVID, the COVID has seriously affected the shipping sector. Now, what they are doing is day by day, they are increasing freight. We cannot do anything. For example, I will tell you, freight from Cochin to US in uh, New York was around $7,500 to $8,000 for one forty foot container. But now, you won't believe it is Twenty-two thousand US dollars. So how we will work out at this level? More than three times. That's one thing. You take for example Bangkok. It was around one thousand eight hundred to two thousand dollar. Now it is four thousand six hundred dollars. So every day this freight is increasing. It is a, another serious problem. Exorbitant uh, freight. Then China. By far, China is our major market as of now. After uh, US, China has emerged as a major market. After the uh, outbreak of the COVID-19, China made COVID test compulsory for all the seafood import from India, not only from India, from everywhere. So what happens here in India, we have to do COVID test and we have to give the test report. Then only they will allow the shipment. But apart from that, when the product, when the consignment reaches the port in China, they take samples and conduct COVID test. This takes a lot of time, sometimes 15 days, 20 days. So what happens? For, uh, for the first four or five days, we get free time from the shipping company. After that, we have to give demerage every day. For the first one week, maybe $100, then $150, like that. So by the time they clear one container, we will have to pay around one lakh to uh, amount to, to the tune of lakhs of rupees by of demerage. So these are all affecting our profitability because these are all unforeseen expenses. This is a serious problem. Then another the serious problem is the detection of antibiotic residue, residue in cultures. Here also, we are taking all possible precautionary measures, but still problem occurs. Recently, there was an instance of a detection of antibiotic-like substance in a consignment of scampi, you know, giant freshwater prawn uh, caught from the wild, which was exported to US. But actually, uh, ultimately, what happened is there was no antibiotic in the product because it was caught from the wild. But what happened? Due to the interaction of chlorine used during processing and its contact with plastic, some chemical compounds resembling an antibiotic residue has come up. We can't do anything. It's a naturally occurring phenomenon. So US FDA came to the conclusion that the processor has used antibiotic and rejected the consignment. So this is a, the kind of uh, testing and going on in these countries. All these testing parameters, uh, they are, uh, param all these parameters are set in their advantage. We are always at a disadvantage position as far as our Indian export is concerned. We have our own quality parameters, but you see, each country, EU has their own quality standards, US has their own, Korea has their own, Saudi Arabia has their own standards, Vietnam has their own standards, uh, Russia has their own standards. So these are the things. So it's very difficult for us to cope with these increasing uh, quality parameters which are imposed by the importing countries. Another problem is the high histamine content in histamine for fishes. In fact, most of the commercially important species are histamine forming fishes, which contains uh, a compound called histidine. When there is uh, temperature abuse, when the fish is uh, kept at above the uh, ambient temperature, above zero degree Celsius, histamine is formed. Histidine is converted to histamine by the action of a bacteria called 
Morganella morgani. So this is due to the poor handling of fish by our fishermen. Even now, even in this 21st century, we are following the 18th century method. If you go to the uh, fishing centers, you can see for catching tuna, many fishermen use small fishing craft. They go in the morning and come back after two or three hours with fresh fish. But what happens? They never take ice with them. So what happens? The fish is exposed to direct sunlight for two to three hours. So by the time they come back, the product will look uh, good, uh, nice outwardly, but inside, histamine formation might have started. So these are all serious problem. The, so we have to impart training. I think Empada has given training on onboard handling of fish products, but these people are even now following age old method. Now I will give you a comparison. You know, Indian Ocean, we have a rich resource of tuna and the very same resource is being shared by Sri Lanka. But when the same tuna, when they catch, it fetches very high price. We sell this for $2.20 $2 .20, while the same tuna Sri Lanka is selling for $4, $5. Why? Why this is happening? Because it is all due to the precautions they take during onboard hand, catching and onboard handling. What they do is immediately after capture, the Can fish you, is killed. Yes. Uh, hey, sir, my we time are is running short of time. Hello. Okay, okay, yes. I will conclude. Yeah. So this is another uh, okay. problem. Uh, and still another problem is the non availability of quality seed and feed for aquaculture. Then frequent flooding of aquaculture farm has affected us. Then new and emerging regulatory measures imposed by imported industries, another problem. These, so these are the problems which we, the industry face today. And I will give you some of the uh, uh, remedial measures before concluding. So we need to regulate fishing efforts we have to train our workers on board handling, uh, see uh, the, the worker, uh, fishermen for proper on board handling of fishes after catching. Then there is a, an urgent need for value addition. Around 90% of our product is going as either as whole fish or gilded and gutted. These fishes are more, mostly going to places like Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, uh, Sri Lanka, where these products are made into value added product and they sent re export to uh, markets like European Union and US. So, what we have to do is we have to shift our focus from volume export, raw material export, to value added product like tuna sticks, fish sticks, fish fillets, breaded shrimps, cooked shrimps, like that. And another idea is for development, uh, I think. Uh, the new entrepreneur science can take is a byproduct utilization. When we process shrimp, huge quantity of shell waste is created. We can use this for the production of chitin and chitosin. You will get all the technology from CIFT. Similarly, the fish offal can be used for the generation of biogas, which can be used for the fisherman village or for the use of the poor people. So, so these are the remedial measures. So do, during this time, I could uh, share with you my experience in the past 35 years. Thank you so much. I, I, I thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Venugopal, sir, for providing insight uh, on uh, export perspectives and domestic uh, fish processing. Now we will go with uh, we have our next speaker, Dr. J. Bindu, Principal Scientist, Fish Processing at ICAR Central Institute of Fish, Fisheries Technology, Kochi, Kerala. Uh, good morning uh, to everyone. Good morning to the organizers and to all the participants. Uh, before I start my presentation, I wish to thank the organizers, Dr. Ananda Ramakrishnan and my director at uh, ICAR CIFT for giving me an opportunity to present uh, this topic. Actually, uh, when you say uh, my previous uh, present, uh, Dr. Venugopal, he has given a brief about fish processing and value addition. Most of the thing 
uh, which he has said I'll be able to show you in the slides. Though I will not be able to take you to the history, but all the processing techniques and the value added products which he had mentioned in his talk will be uh, shown in this uh, slides. Uh, something about the global scenario, like we said, uh, fish provides 6.7 protein percent of all the protein which is consumed by the humans all over the world. And uh, this fishery industry by itself is a huge industry employing about 57 million people. And most of them, one third of them are mainly in the aquaculture because culture is like over the years, uh, fish culture, aquaculture is coming up in a big way. When you look at the global trade also, fishery products account to 1%, which is really 9% of the total agriculture commodities. And FEO has estimated that the average uh, per capita consumption of fish will increase to 25 kg by the end of 2030, mainly because the health benefits of having fish and the easy digest digestibility of uh, this commodity. And the net supply at the same time because of aquaculture is going to increase by 1.6 million tons. So there's a huge potential for seafood and to expand and to reach new markets. So when you look of uh, Indian seafoods, you can say that it's an expanding food hub. Earlier, it was only export oriented. We have heard the history and now we are coming more into the domestic market. So much of promotions for seafood uh, uh, production as well as for industrial uh, applications are being introduced by the present government. When you look at that, India ranks uh, third in fisheries production and second in aquaculture production. And we contribute nearly 7.57% uh, to the global fish production. And the exports we rank as fourth. During the last financial year, India has exported nearly 11.5 lakh metric tons of seafood, uh, accounting to 5.96 billion US dollars. That is nearly uh, 43 thousand crores uh, as per MPEDA and uh, actually like uh, earlier it was uh, we were uh, exporting volume now we are looking into making it more into value added and value addition especially in the ready to eat and ready to cook for both for domestic as well as for export markets. So like we said so much is talked about fish uh, why is that importance for fish mainly because it's an easily digestible protein compared to any uh, land animal or any other protein. And it is rich in unsaturated fatty acids, mainly omega fatty acids, uh, as a result of which uh, uh, it is a hard food. They always say fish is a hard food, uh, which uh, by which by consuming this omega uh, fatty acid, you can reduce your serum cholesterol level and uh, it is favored. That's why any doctor or anyone says you have seafood, especially seafood, small, small seafood, which also give you a content of uh, phosphorus from the bones also. And then uh, one thing about seafood is you have a wide variety of species, unlike chicken or meat or bantan or beef or anything that is limited, but a variety of species and each one has a different taste. Uh, when you look at even uh, fishes or shellfishes or mollusks or anything, everything has a particular taste of its own. And there's a wide variety of species from which you can choose from when you use seafood. And we process the seafood mainly to extend the shelf life of the commodity, to increase its uh, palatability and sensory attributes, to maintain or improve the nutritive properties. To ensure safety of the product, not to give a spoiled product, to ensure the safety so that it is processed and kept at a particular temperature so that the, the seafood is safe and to have a reach, to reach different distant markets. Like uh, you manufacture in India, it is marketed in Russia, US or the European Union. And to increase convenience in handling and consumption and, and enhance the economic value of food. In, by enhancing the economic value of food, we get uh, valuable foreign returns and we make a profit on it. Ultimately, which goes back, we hope it goes back to the uh, primary producer or the fisherman who is uh, catching the fish from the sea. So along with the uh, production, value addition, any what when you say value addition, value addition can be 
by having an any any additional uh, activity in one way or the other in a small way also if you change the nature of the product and adds value to it at the point of sale and uh, what what do you sell at 50 rupees if you clean it if you clean a fish gut it uh, uh, pack it properly you can sell it for 100 rupees the same quantity of fish so there is an increase in worth or value of the product after a simple process or it can be a complex process and all this by doing this you in have uh, you have an income you increase the income and you increase the profitability of the fish in the processing line and utilization you process suppose you have a bulk catch sometimes what happens is seasonal variations are there in certain fish species so at some time you have a bulk catch where you can't uh, market it the same way so you process it and keep in such a way that it can be utilized in a later stage and there's a growing demand for value-added products both national and international markets and also uh, people are going like uh, especially people are going into innovative or new new foods what foods you were not having earlier you're now tasting out and to keep uh, pace with the consumer needs and to provide a wide variety of products according to the requirements of the consumer. So for all these uh, points, we need to have some value addition and we cannot just go on like uh, Mr. Venukopal had said, uh, we are exporting big fishes to Vietnam, Thailand and all, and they are reprocessing it into value added products and then marketing. So the cost, uh, the, the benefit of the uh, of, of that fish or that uh, they get the money for it because of they are doing the value addition whereas the rate which we sell the whole fish will be at a lower cost so when you look at preservation methods there are many preservation methods for uh, n number of preservation methods you can apply everything in a, a little way uh, to uh, seafoods also but uh, basically in this uh, presentation today i'll be uh, I'll be targeting only the main common ones. Mainly, uh, you can just roughly divide it into two types. That is thermal processing and non-thermal processing. Thermal processing uh, by itself, it requires heat. It is, uh, it is done at a higher temperature. It can be thermal processing. It can be drying or smoking or extrusion. So we will be talking about those three uh, processing uh, techniques. And in the non-thermal processing, only for fish, more of uh, non-thermal processing uh, is applied because um, majority of the products which are exported from our country um, uh, goes in the frozen form after freezing. And uh, also in the domestic or local market, if you want to have fresh fish, it is always in the non-thermal uh, processing technique because uh, it is in either in the chill form or frozen form, it is marketed. So we will be looking at chilling, freezing, freeze drying and high pressure processing, which is a relatively uh, like when you think uh, there's, there's a lot of non-thermal uh, processing technique, which is coming up in a big way. So much is talked about non-thermal processing uh, technique, but of all the techniques uh, where, which can be readily applied to uh, high pressure, high pressure is only a processing technique which has been uh, successfully applied to uh, seafoods. So when you look at fresh fish, you can see the fresh fish is the most perishable because of its high amino acid content. It is highly perishable. And once the quality of a fish is lost, you can never regain it back. And post office losses, mainly because of improper handling, icing. Like, uh, like we said, the small vessels, they do not take ice on board because they go in the morning and come back in the evening. But then the quality of the fish that is freshly caught from the ocean is, uh, is lost or partly it is lost. And uh, we have to do uh, suitable icing and storing in good containers uh, to prevent this loss or post harvest loss. So basically for transportation, short distance transportation for storage of uh, 5 to 10 days, they use, depending on the fish species, it all depends on what time uh, you've caught the fish, what is the uh, fat content of the fish and how much uh, delay has been there in icing, all that matters in uh, fish storage and handling. So you can use puff insulated containers for storage, or uh, you can use uh, expanded thermo, uh, uh, polystyrene containers or thermofoam containers, or also HDPE boxes for 
storing the size. But that is only for uh, for your handling from your landing center to your processing facility, or maybe for a short distance uh, transportation of fresh fish from one place to another. And uh, next is chilling. Chilling is also done with the ice that you use. Uh, there is a process. There is a process of chilling, wherein the uh, the temperature of the fish is brought down. Always, we always say you have to uh, ice the fish in the ratio one is to one in layers, so that uh, the temperature of and if you have a little slurry in it, the temperature can be a little more lower in it, and you can hold it at zero to two degrees which is near freezing point, but it, the fish doesn't uh, freeze in this. So you can use uh, chilling with ice, you can use air chilling, or you can use refrigerated seawater or uh, chill seawater, whatever, uh, depending on your duration of your fishing or the type of fishing vessel. And for uh, or what uh, solid uh, carbon dioxide is also used, dry ice for transportation uh, from air lifting of some uh, some particular fish species from one place to, if I want to send something from Cochin to Dubai, I cannot put ice in this thing in a flight. So I'll be using some uh, dry ice for that. So shelf life, uh, it depends on the species and uh, lean freshwater fishes, the tropical fishes have better uh, stability than their counterparts. Okay. Uh, chill uh, fish items. Now, of like what we have seen, we, uh, we since uh, uh, my director had said we have an incubation facility here in CIFT, we have been uh, a lot of, uh, especially after the, I think um, the small entrepreneurs have come up after the COVID uh, scenario. Many of the people who have, uh, who had regular jobs abroad and all, they've come back and they've started small businesses. So a lot of uh, seafood, uh, uh, what um, uh, chill stores where uh, fish vending or the fish display units uh, have been have come up in Cochin and nearby hubs. A lot of chain chain of uh, such franchises also have come up where fresh fish was uh, taken from the market. It was cleaned or it was displayed and then sold uh, directly. So uh, those type ventures, many of them have come up. Like earlier, fish used to be sold in the open without any but now even in a big supermarket uh, earlier fish market used to be uh, somewhere very far off from the uh, uh, other commodities you wouldn't have a mall uh, you wouldn't have a fish store in a mall but now fish store uh, in many of the malls here we have a fish store where you can readily go and buy the fish because so much have come up uh, have come up in the way it is displayed and uh, vending machines and things like that, that there is no smell or loss of water or you can't say that the fish is being handled there in that shop. So those type of uh, fish vending kiosks and many of uh, have come up and we have handheld many entrepreneurs in that. Chill fish in different forms, you can market it as fillet, as steaks, as uh, cubes or uh, steaks or uh, whatever forms you want, whatever uh, forms, uh, the consumer demands you you can you are able to market it this is one success story which uh, cft also had a part of uh, part in it which is uh, done with or a fish uh, bobp under the bobp program uh, where uh, one entrepreneur he was he was daily going and fishing uh, different types of fish but he made saw to it that he took slurry ice on board and he cut it and killed and cleaned the fish Nothing was, uh, the fish was cleaned exactly at the sea as it was caught. It was brought back and then now he's uh, marketing his product as uh, the tuna also uh, and many other uh, swordfish and many other species he's marketing as in the brand name or a fish. And it is being airlifted to restaurants in New Delhi for sashimi and things like that. So if you, if you really put your hand and of course, um, you, uh, it may be difficult for a newcomer in it, but if you have the proper funding and the proper guidance, you can uh, have it and the proper market also, you can have. really, this is a very successful venture. At the same time, uh, for fresh fish, another way of extending the shelf life is by modified atmosphere packaging. And like, uh, it is uh, it is not very popular in India, but uh, in 
foreign countries in the European Union and America now. Fresh fish for extending the shelf life of fresh fish, they modify the atmosphere in which it is stored or packed. So different by using different uh, gas combinations so that the degradation of the microorganisms and the development of oxidative density is retarded. So in this method also you can extend ordinary if you get uh, five days maybe by doing modified atmosphere you can get an extension of shelf life uh, for 10 days and the most common uh, method of uh, processing what we are following in india is uh, freezing technology like uh, we said it is mainly freezing is a conversion of water present uh, to ice and it is uh, mostly done at uh, minus uh, 40 degrees centigrade and all the frozen products are stored at minus 18 plus or minus 2. Uh, and by freezing what happened the available water uh, will not be uh, made available to the microorganisms and also enzymatic uh, actions and as a result of which fish can be kept for a longer period. Basically two types uh, air blast freezing where there's a continuous stream of cold air is passed over the product and as a result of which it freezes and then we have the plate or contact freezing where the product is directly placed as uh, i hope you can recollect uh, he uh, mr venukopal said two and uh, four kg or uh, five pounds like that uh, boxes or blocks they make it so the this is the picture earlier frozen foods is mainly export oriented where, uh, but recently now we have innovative products. Domestic market is also very good, and uh, individually quick frozen products also fetch a better price or higher price than conventional block frozen products. And uh, whatever forms uh, like uh, uh, shrimps also, you can have the whole shrimp as such. You can have a headless. You can have a peeled. Where some you can have peeled and deveined, or uh, you can have a cooked with tail on whatever forms you want the industry is able to provide and uh, so that uh, what what places the customer customer he is able to uh, uh, do it and along with shrimps also uh, you can have fish fillet you can have squid cuttle fish or whatever uh, whatever the company in this uh, picture you see a uh, uh, spiral freezer where they are uh, freezing the shrimp and the other one are fish fillet. Uh, this is uh, these are uh, pictures of IQF freezers like uh, earlier you, you can see the shrimp which comes through an air blast and then it is uh, frozen. IQF freezer is like more like a, you have an air blast from the bottom and uh, from the top and the uh, shrimps are uh, frozen in the suspended form like a pack of peanuts or cashew nuts you can have individual shrimps by itself and uh, in the bottom you see the plate frozen uh, blocks you can have a vertical or you can have a horizontal uh, block frozen this picture shows you the block frozen shrimp along with mostly it's given uh, 8 to 12 that means 8 to 12 pieces may be there in uh, 454 uh, grams that is a one pound of shrimp and U2, you can see that uh, squid U3, three, uh, up to three can be there in a kg. So you can have block frozen, you can pack it in a duplex carton uh, or, uh, or a ma ma master poly bag and then uh, market it. IQF shrimps also, you can, you can see this, each one is individually frozen. As a result of which you can, uh, it is easier for you to handle and also uh, uh, um, easier for you to handle. And if you want to use, uh, you can use a little part. You can open a pack, use uh, some part of it. You can, you can reseal it and then keep it back so that you can use it at a, a future period. You can have cooked, uh, like uh, Sir said, the earlier speaker said, you can have a cook so that you can readily uh, consume the product also. That is mainly uh, what I've told is mainly which uh, export how the things work. But in our internal market also, we have a lot of freshwater with the importance of aquaculture and so much of freshwater fish is being uh, produced in the country. A lot of uh, products are frozen for domestic market and you have a rohu fillet, um, uh, rohu fish curry cut, tilapia fillet, fungaceous steaks, fungaceous fillet, so many things. 
uh, packed in uh, trays and then uh, packed in a polythene cover or as such, which are frozen and which are available in the market. These are all our uh, products which are there in the local market. You can have specialty products if you want a high-end uh, specialty products, also value-added products. You can do with shrimps. You can have it uh, butterfly style or skewered or uh, shrimp and vegetable kebab or shrimp cocktail. Whatever type of product you want to make, you can make it. And I mean, some of the groups are making it, which is mainly going to the export market. And uh, this is uh, about frozen mussel because in Kerala, the ODOP is mussel products. So I've just put a slide showing different types of mussel products, shell on or half shell or in sauce or in wine or whatever it is, you can have it in the uh, frozen form. Tree string uh, is also another technique. Uh, maybe a very, very low percent of uh, uh, freeze dried products are exported. One or two companies only are there in India, but uh, I think three, uh, three or four, mainly the uh, shrimps are the main things which are exported in the freeze dried form. Mainly, maybe for some salads or from a uh, cocktail or for uh, adding in uh, noodles uh, pack or something like that. But uh, freeze dried products are also. Uh, one product which is uh, exported from our country. Then you have mince and surubi based products. Fish mince, especially after filleting, if you have an industry and after filleting uh, uh, the fish, you have a lot of filleting waste. Uh, the fish mince can be concentrated or uh, uh, removed and then that can be uh, used as fish mince for doing value added products. Or uh, as such, we have a group in uh, Ratnagiri, Gadre Marain, where they buy fish as such and they make uh, surmi with it. And from that surmi, they uh, uh, process it uh, and make different uh, analog products or uh, fibrized products, which uh, which goes mainly to the export. But a few, I think, in the brand Gadre brand, it is available uh, locally also in the country. So fish, uh, you get to buy fish kima as such, which is fish mince, or you can, uh, and surmi is always rectangular blocks, which is frozen and kept in the frozen form, so that when you want the material, you can thaw it and then uh, develop your product from it. So uh, these are some of the surmi products, value-added products, uh, like uh, crab claws, crab fingers. You can have uh, in the shape of a lobster or a, a surmi block, uh, uh, you, uh, with these means based products, you also can make a lot of uh, other products. It is being made in the country and it's being marketed also like fish cutlets, burgers, patties, fish fingers, fish balls, uh, fish cakes, sausages, wafers, soup powder, momos, puppet, and other products. So with uh, it is with these mints we make most of the battered and breaded products also battered and breaded mainly which i mentioned in the earliest and the cutlets and the patties and burgers uh, mainly 50% uh, of the uh, material in that product has to be uh, fish portion the other thing it can be a batter or a bread crumb or it can be vegetables or other seasonings so i can uh, production of battered and breaded products it's uh, many many of the industries uh, which I export. They have a subsidiary uh, for the domestic trade. Most of the even in Cochin, we have a lot of seafood exporting companies where they do a subsidiary uh, battered and breaded product line, which they market it in domestically. Two types of coatings are basically used: the batter and the bread crumbs. So. Uh, in the production, first you have a portioning where you decide what your product is. You may have fish in it, you may have vegetable or whatever product. Then you pre-dust it and then you apply the batter and then apply the breading and then pre-fry it. And then you freeze it so that you can keep it, uh, uh, pack it and keep it so that you can market it within the cold chain and it can go to different places. Uh, at the same time, not just fish, you have all... Uh, uh, vegetable cutlet, vegetable samosa, a lot of vegetable products mm -hmm. also coming in the frozen form. So these are different types of uh, batch and breaded product. They are mm -hmm. also known as coated product because of the external coating on it. 
and uh, you can have uh, fish uh, fish fingers fish balls fish cutlet patties a any shape any size whatever uh, you want if you have a die for it if you are manufacturing on a larger scale uh, you have a or a semi commercial uh, battering line you can have different types of dies what shape you want you can make your product so that uh, attract it it can attract the consumer so this is uh, basically uh, what you see you have a bat um, battering line and then you have a bread crumbs a full automation is available for this uh, for this mechanism so that uh, only thing you have to feed the raw material at one end and the other end it comes out in the final form so that there is no contamination of minimum uh, uh, human intervention in it so you can have you can uh, pre-fry it and then pack it or you can just uh, pack it as such and then freeze it and then you can market your product so these are some pictures uh, some products which are available in the local market uh, gadre fish fingers fish pops uh, breaded buffet is a kerala based company and uh, they have uh, fish fingers and all the product even briller tasty nibbles frozen fish cutlet popcorn fish all uh, a lot of products are uh, there in the market all, only thing what we have to ensure always is for these products they are that cold chain has to be maintained during transportation and also during storage uh, so that uh, the products are intact and there is no in case there is a uh, what uh, lowering of temperature uh, sometimes uh, the product when you fry it may not uh, it may break apart or uh, some off taste may uh, may have occurred so for that you have to always ensure that cold chain is maintained and uh, you see also when you go to a supermarket you see many of uh, of the venkis so many so many products so many even your uh, um, uh, so many product all these smileys french fries everything in the frozen form they are marketed uh, what uh, baby corn so so many things vegetable products and meat products and fish products so there is so much of scope for such products then we come to uh, thermal process after frozen all these products which i told earlier they can be stored in the frozen form and they are not. and then we come to thermal processing which is basically the application of heat uh, thermal processing is also done in uh, mainly three different containers mainly cans different types of cans are used uh, the seafood industry also started after the uh, what uh, prawn part it was the canning which uh, which uh, progressed in the industry and then only we came to frozen product so age old canning it is still relevant and it's still being used in a big way especially for long term storage for military uh, for uh, transportation or uh, because the shelf life of products in can may be up to one year more than one year up to two years you can have and uh, it, it can go much more than that also depending on your product and so different types of cans are there uh, you have tall cans you have square cans dingley cans cylindrical cans whatever uh, depending on the type of product not just fish so many meat and sausages and uh, other materials also uh, packed in cans these are the pictures of three uh, uh, retorts which we have in our institute a steam air retort and a water immersion retort and a, a smaller steam air retort and different types of can products also we can uh, develop a region specific if you want uh, want it uh, in west bengal you can have it uh, based on the curry or you can have a local kerala style or tamil style or whatever in, in any any region any uh, state what you want a particular type of curry we can make it in can then we have the retortable pouches they are also uh, this function in the same way as cans but because of thin profile uh, they are very thin their pouches uh, the processing time is less and as a result of which you have uh, you have a uh, you can say better quality because of the processing time is less uh, the process uh, the products are much uh, 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 it, they taste better, not better than uh, canned products. Especially for canning, mainly um, it takes a longer time for the core temperature uh, to reach the particular uh, uh, temperature. So it takes a longer time. But in uh, retortable pouches, at least about 30% less time it takes. And 
it is more handy and you can uh, carry it uh, easily and uh, even for storing and stacking and all it is much more easier cft has done a lot of work on retort pouch processing and uh, in uh, clear pouches and also opaque opaque uh, pouches and uh, i've transferred technologies to many entrepreneurs which are in the market in between both the scan and uh, pouch you have uh, thermoform containers uh, which are uh, now uh, not now the the advantage of these thermoform containers are that uh, the product can be processed and also uh, uh, eaten in the same container because it is an open tray like container so you can do different types of product uh, sometimes uh, you can process it one time when you consume you can just uh, peel off the lid and then microwave and then um, consume it they are they are little uh, it's not very rigid cans are very rigid but these are uh, semi flexible or semi rigid and containers such containers are also gaining a lot of importance now then we have the extrusion uh, technology extrusion processing also uh, Though directly fish is not applied, uh, only very very small quantity of fish extruded products is uh, developed by fish. You can use uh, fish because uh, mainly extruded products are made with cereal flows, and the cereal flows contain only uh, carbohydrates. So by adding fish in it, you can enhance the protein content of these uh, pro products. You can have puff snacks. You can do pasta. You can have noodles uh, incorporating fish so that you increase the uh, protein content of the product. Uh, these are this is the facility which we have, and one uh, one uh, local uh, company entrepreneur in uh, Cochin they have developed uh, these products. Uh, after freezing, thermal processing. Drying technology is also a big uh, thing because uh, earlier, before all these technologies, freezing or uh, thermal processing came into being, drying was used in a big way. And it's still, especially the coastal uh, villages where uh, fish is uh, 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 caught, once a uh, day's catch is uh, sold off, if there is any balance, it was always dried with salt, either salt or it was dried as such. So even now about 20% uh, of products and uh, are marketed in the dried form. And that, that shift from the traditional way of uh, drying fish, it has uh, changed uh, to, to new modern uh, ways so that uh, it is done more hygienically and in, uh, the products are aimed for uh, uh, what, con um, safety and uh, consumer conscious uh, people so as a result of which uh, instead of traditional drying they've gone to solar dryer or mechanical dryers where uh, uh, the products are hygienically handled and packed dried and packed and uh, marketed and uh, there's a huge potential for this this is uh, one of the vendors uh, fish uh, entrepreneur he's selling it uh, you can, you can see it is you can see the uh, products are displayed in uh, just like any other uh, bakery or uh, something like that he is displayed all his dry fish as such which which is a new concept and which looks very attractive and different types of packing uh, also can be uh, done for Nan, yeah, yeah uh, i'm finishing hello yeah yeah uh, ma'am we Please are running short of yeah yeah uh, another uh, uh, thing is smoking. Smoking is also uh, not uh, very popular, but in the Lakshadweep Islands in the Northeast, uh, in Orissa, and some place in Andhra, also smoke products are consumed in a big way. Uh, this also, uh, you can directly smoke the fish or you can use liquid smoke. And uh, this is a picture of uh, muscle value added products which have been developed at CIFT. Another uh, industry which you can start is uh, fish base, fish pickle. Uh, we have the facility for all that. And uh, a lot of uh, fish base uh, uh, pickles are there in the market also. And other things are fish wafers or fish crackers. Uh, by using uh, fish mints and all the cereals which is blend and made into puppet or wafers, which can be taken as a snack. 
fish soup powder is also uh, which can be used uh, which which is prepared from fish and fortified with iron and calcium and uh, can be used as and when required chutney powders uh, biscuits uh, energy bars health drinks all this can be used uh, can be prepared from fish this uh, about uh, high pressure processing also it's a non thermal which is uh, uh, which is applicable to fish and which has been utilized by many countries worldwide and uh, we have done a lot of products because we have a machine we have done some of the mainly it is applicable to uh, shellfish products where you can extract the whole uh, meat from the uh, shell and also for modification or texture uh, modification in sausages and fish balls or uh, etc by products uh, like uh, we said chitin chitosan a uh, plenty of products can be developed from uh, chitin and chitosan that's a prawn shell based a lot of companies have taken the technology from you and they are marketing or exporting the product and this is uh, sift fish uh, pro is uh, it's a uh, app which is available on our website uh, our website is cft.res.in uh, you can have it on your mobile also it is on google play store also is there or you can search where you get uh, information on fish products uh and also like uh, if you want to do scaling up how much quantity or how much kg of fish has to be used and price and things like that which you can feed in and you can calculate thank you thank you so much ma'am for providing a in depth uh, details on uh, value added products processing and technology and moving ahead with the next uh, speaker uh, we have between dr murli yes scientist fish processing icar sift Kochi, Kerala. First of all, good morning uh, for all the participants. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank our director, Dr. Ravi Shankar sir, also Dr. Uh, Arundhra Mukherjee sir, uh, uh, Niptum Tanjavur, and other organizers for giving me this opportunity to present our research uh, works. I will be briefly going through the equipments and machineries involved in the micro fish processing units. So uh, let us have the equipments and the machineries in the different headings. functional based say based on the operations when there are different operations see there is a pre processing operations processing operations then preservation then packaging so we try to segregate the equipments under different headings so that it will be easy for our understanding when we say pre processing there is a cleaning process sorting process skinning process scaling gutting beading and filleting operations when we say processing it includes all the heat process like drying steaming baking blanching frying retorting in addition uh, we also have some uh, cold uh, uh, treatment processes like preservation process like chilling freezing all those things then finally we have a packaging under head the packaging we have some sealing machines so one by one we will go through but since uh, the previous speaker madam uh, bindu madam has exhaustively covered on the value addition different types of value added products in addition she also shown all type of equipments involved in it in, in all slides so those things we will quickly go through then we have something uh, we have successfully uh, incubated and we have brought out uh, the fish uh, micro fish processing units especially in the dry fish production area so that area i will be concentrating more on this presentation so other things i will briefly go through so first of all when we say pre processing there are requirements of cleaning equipments grading equipments you can see there is a fish washing machine it is a very simple machine you have uh, water jets in the top the material will flow in the conveyor then it get cleaned then finally there will be a tub in with water there is chlorinated water it will stay there and eventually it will be cleaned and the uh, waste water will be separately taken out then there is a fish grading machines we have different rollers connected uh, in the platform then we have different trays in the down so the rollers will be rotating then the rollers are positioned in such a way that when it starts from top you can see my cursor there is a place where you are feeding it there is a conveyor the material is coming the fishes are coming here these rollers are rotating then these rollers are kept in a diagonal position you will find that in the initial there will be lesser gap then when eventually at the end there is a bigger gap when the fishes are moving in this based on the size the thickness it will fall 
fall down and we have different trays. So accordingly, the fish can be sorted according to the size or whatever way we decide. And now in this presentation, I am not going to tell what is the capacity, how much it is the cost. It, it, it depends upon what is the type of process line you wanted to have it or what is the capacity you want to handle it. Accordingly, it will vary. So just for our information, I am telling these are the equipments and machineries which are available. So when we say there is a descaling machine, we have to remove the scales of the fishes. So we have at present in CAFT, we have developed, there is a hand operated fish descaling machine. We have a motorized fish descaling machine. We also have a variable drum speed uh, descaling machine. So basically this descaling machine, it is basically a cylindrical drum. So inside there is a SS uh, drum with that there are different nailings have been done. We can say some slits will be there, which is able to make a friction. So when there is a provision to open the uh, drum here, from here the drum can be opened, then you can able to drop it. Say some, uh, this is for three kg, you can put about two kg of fish, then the drum can be slowly rotated with this, this handle. So when we rotate it, the fish goes with the cylinder, after some distance it comes down. Due to gravity it comes down. So there is already aberrations in the cylinder, there is an inside drum, there is a perforated drum. So with that there is a friction happens. It goes up and then comes down due to weight, gravity. So like that when it happens, due to friction between the drum and the uh, fish, the scales are removed. And eventually when the uh, descaling is over, say for hand-referred descaling machine with the different fish, the time varies. But on an average about three to four minutes, we can able to remove about 90 to 95 percentage of scales. And this is meant for only medium size, small and medium size of fishes, not for the big fishes. So once the uh, descaling is over, we have to open it through the we can able to keep a tray down and then we can take out the descaled one. Similarly, we have motorized the same hand operated one. Here we have a half HP motor, then the same drum. This capacity is about uh, 10 kg, we can drop it. So here the same principle. Here we have uh, optimized, standardized the rotations, RPM. So about 20 to 30 RPM, it will per minute, 20 to 30 rotations, it will be there. So here also, if somebody wanted to have a little bit higher capacity, they can go for it. Then we also have a variable speed. There, as I told, we have already optimized and kept 20 to 30 RPM. Here, the RPM can be changed. In addition, we also have a water jet from top. So there is a perforation here. The water also will drop so that whatever the scales that are coming out, that also will be clearly removed and we can separately collect it from bottom. There is a opening here outlet through which the water and the scales can be collected. So this is how this variable speed descaling machine works in the pre-processing stage. Then we also have different uh, the scale, scalar machines. Say there is a battery operated descalers. There is a electrical connected uh, descalers. So this type of also it is available in the market. Then there is a filleting machine. There is a filleting. So when there is a deheaded and a properly gutted fish that is sent in a, a roller in between two rollers, when it goes inside, there is a disc. There are two discs which are kept in a gap of about the what is the gap between uh, this disc will be same as the uh, what is our expected thickness of the bone in the fish so when the fish is going inside the bone will be kept inside and the both the sides will be properly cut and we will get the two pieces so this is the filleting machines the two fillets will come out in this then we also have a uh, d skinner see this is a sort of a semi-automatic there is a roller rotating inside we have to uh, take the properly gutted, deheaded fish. Then the scale has to be manually attached. This position, there is a ro uh, roller here. Operated operations will be there in the top. So when the skin is attached, there is a fo uh, foot operated pedal here. So we have to just to press it. When we press, the skin will be rolled in that. So that we will get the, uh, without uh, the skin can be get. Similarly, we have a cutting machine. Uh, these saw based things which we can normally see for any food product cutting can be used. When we say processing operations, under that when there is a meat bone separator, whatever madam has previously spoken about different value added products, say batter and breader products, surumi products and whatever other value added products can be prepared that through the minced product, the minced product, the mince which we can get from fish through the meat bone separator. This is a very simple setup. There is a perforated drum, SS drum, perforated drum is there. There is a belt down. 
so there are different pulleys to maintain that pressure this um, pressure so there is a very very small gap between this uh, uh, perforated drum and your belt conveyor this roll so when the fish is dropped from top it will come down then it will crush when it is crushing the bone will be retained in the center all the muscle portions will go inside you can see here from the top picture you see the fish is fed here that is deheaded properly cleaned fish is put here then the fish due to friction the all the muscles portion goes inside you can see it here so the eventually the bone will be retained here separately it can be taken out this what you are seeing from bottom is our cft developed fish meat bone separator of same principle there is a belt and drum type so then madam has already shown there are batten breaded machines which with the farming unit you can see here when we have a mince that can be put inside as madam told you have different dies for whatever shape you require that can be accordingly produced when these things will come eventually we wanted to batter it or you want to add the bread crumbs and it has to be uh, chilled or it has to be fried everything can be attached with this so this is a machine for battering and breading then there are different fryers uh, automatically are controlled fryers temperature time everything can be controlled then we have a uh, retard uh, processing machines so this is a horizontal steam operator uh, steam based retard machine when you wanted to do more than 100 degrees celsius steaming it can be done here then uh, it can be taken under preservation or the material handling and transportation it can be taken we have different ice making machines there is a block ice making machine here there is a flake ice there is a tube ice also there is a plate ice makers so it is for your information there are different types and there are different variants in the ice also then in the chilling also chilling and uh, freezing uh, you can see that there are different types of freezers as madam has clearly pointed out there are flat freezers you also see there is a air blast freezers you can have a look at look at here there will be air blast cold air will be blast across your product which is kept in the trays plate freezer means you have different trays the material has been kept and then it will be rather it can be say contact freezing it will be frozen i uh, means frozen with the trays so due to uh, the cooling effect of this trays will come to your product and this get will this will get um, uh, frozen then we also have a tunnel freezers the same principle you have the tunnel and the material is conveying from one end to another end from top you have the uh, cold air spray and then accordingly the material will get sprayed we also have a iqf madam has clearly told in the previous session then there are packaging machines like and sealers band sealers tray sealers these are all the basic things one uh, need to have in a processing unit then there are labeling and coding machines you have to label it when it was packed how it was packed what was the batch number date expiry all those stuffs then once you have packed and then it has to be properly strapped and bundled and it, that has to be kept in the cold state since it is a highly perishable product although you have frozen the product or you have chilled it whatever may be that has to be properly packed then it is labeled appropriately then it has to be properly strapped bundled and kept in the cold storage so this is under different heading i was giving you uh, machineries briefly then we will go as uh, basically the drying it is in the main process what we actually work so i wanted to give more information on this drying area so ma madam has also given a one slide on uh, fish drying technology see about 20 to 30 percentage of fish that is caught in india is being dried or processed either for export purpose or for the local consumption and we know mostly when we say outside people uh, traditional method is open sun drying they directly expose the material to solar radiation and the natural flow of wind what happens the energy is free renewable abundant the method is very cheap but what is the drawback this is depend upon weather when we do it outside there is a scope for insect first infestation microbes infestation then there is a loss of or damage to the product there is a study in india which says that about 30 to 40 30 to 40 percentage of material that is kept for drying in open sun drying is lost due to all the factors whether your dust uh, insects pests other microbes then it is a time consuming process we may have to wait for days together and it is a labor incentive somebody has to go there spread it take it keep it all those spreading turning sifting all those things will be there so what is the other opportunities or what is the alternative before that let us see what is the dry fish status in india as i already told about different studies says different ranges about 20 to 30 percentage of fish are dried then mostly 
the catch surplus when the catch is more people are going for drying then there is a low valley fishes trash fishes they are going for drying then there are fishes which are having very low shelf life it has to be immediately consumed or it has to be processed so those type of fishes drying is the best way then our especially the marine fishes are caught and dried and transported to the inland areas for domestic consumption and the dry fish as a subsistence activity which is contributing about 7% to the total fish export and there is a study a report by uh, agricultural process export and development authority in 2016 they are telling if this dry fish is connected with map modified atmospheric packaging then the dry fish share in the total export can be increased to 25% now presently at 7% it can be increased for your information there is a biggest uh, dry fish market rather it's a largest dry fish market in asia that is jagiro dry fish market in assam so its importance it is a sheep so source of nutrition as our director has rightly pointed out in, a, in his introductory remarks that this dried fishes low value fish trash fish can be given as a nutritional supplementation in fact we have a project we have a collaboration with our odisha fisheries department we have recently given uh, some 10 numbers of solar tunnel dryers there so their self help group people will dry it then it can be given as a nutritional supplementation either in the form of dry fish or that can be powdered and given as a soup powder we are already in the process once the material is dried it can be available throughout the year then we no need to bother about the perishability concerns and the price variations and all then it can be a rural livelihood and income then during these times especially during our uh, pandemic situation and all when we are not getting the fresh fish if it is properly hygienically dried then this fish will uh, satisfy the requirements of the consumers say we have a solar uh, drying system it can we can go for a mechanical dryer solar dryers for that matter any novel drying techniques but the better bet than the open sun drying with the cast and other stuffs we can go for solar drying so what is the advantages there is it is environmental friendly economically viable uh, we can enhance the solar radiation over the open sun drying then we can increase the temperature we can reduce the rh we can improve the drying rates we can end up in uh, lower moisture content that is the desirable one also the drying time can be reduced in addition the quality in terms of taste color nutrition value can be improved then what are the drawbacks non reliability non reliability that is during off sunshine hours we may not be able to dry it uh, in fact that is rainy days cloudy days and night so we have done some uh, hybrid drying systems so we have given some backup systems so during off sense in hours also the dryer has to work so this area why i am concentrating we have successful incubators here we have a incubation section so people come here we hand hold them then finally they take up some particular technology for that matter any value added product or the dry fish then we will be hand holding them we have a pilot plant facility here we have dryers people come from outside we give them for 6 to 1 year 6 months to 1 year we give a time for them so they come here they use our facility once they are okay with that their technology is okay for them they will do test marketing once it is done they will eventually go out and take their own dryer we have a system here we have empaneled different manufacturers for dryers so we have a list of uh, manufacturers so any client comes here we will show them so they will choose according to their requirement and then they will take up and they will get their own fsa license and all other things required so they are successfully started and it is running so in that connection only i am uh, getting more deeper into this discussion so solar drying uh, this i don't want to explain further we have a small structure we have to have some uh, solar collector there is a inlet outlet the drying will occur then there are different types there is a drying chamber solar collector there are flat plate evacuator tube collectors and some more then there should be air flow system these are the essential parts then we also have a different methods of drying there is a direct method indirect method mixed mode hybrid mode then i will come to the solar sip dryers we have uh, the, there is a um, trademark for us there is a sip tech sip dry so we have one solar uh, solar uh, hybrid dryer of about 60 kg this is a solar dryer working based on water based system then we also given a lpg backup here so i will be explaining uh, in for subsequent slides here what we have given there is a efficient heating backup is there this is environmental friendly there is a multi purpose it can be used other than fish it can be used for other purpose we have different controls plc systems uh, the cost of drying is very less we have a weatherproof system uh, so with this 
let me go to our dryers there is a 20 kg dryer this is working based on aerating system we have a solar aerating collectors in the top there is a opening from here the air will go inside it get heated up then it comes to the drying chamber we have a temperature sensor here whatever temperature you want to dry it for say for fish drying we keep 55 to 60 degrees celsius the temperature will be maintained through this heating coil it will check what is the incoming temperature accordingly if there is a requirement it will increase and then the required temperature will be maintained it is about 20 kg the drying time is about eight hours uh, so it is costing about one and a half lakhs it is approximate it can be used for other products similarly we have a lpg system here uh, you can see here this is a solar lpg hybrid dryer this is working based on water heating system the water will be kept in the tank you can see it from here water will be there this water will be circulated to your collector here when it is moving to your collector, this is a flat flat water collector, the water gets heated up. When the heated water will come and stay in the same tank, due to thermocline difference, the cold water will be in the bottom, hot water will be in the top. Then this hot water will be subsequently sent through a pump. With the help of a pump, it will send to the radiator. That is heat exchanger, which is placed inside the drying chamber. When it is going to one, and then it will go to the second, and then it will come out. During this time, there is a air movement inside. Fresh air will come through the blower. Then the heat transfer occurs here. There is a cross flow heat transfer. The fresh air will get heat from the water and the water will release its heat. Then it will go back and come to the bottom of the tank because it has released all its heat. So it becomes cold and it is coming to the tank. Similarly, say it is a half sunshine hour. We have no sunshine. So we have to have a backup. So we have given a LPG cylinder here. So this cylinder, whenever there is the required temperature is not met in the water. Say here I want a 60 degrees Celsius in the drying chamber. I require it about 80 degrees Celsius. If 80 degrees Celsius is required, this has to heat. The LPG system will take water from bottom. It will heat and then give it to the top. So because we are taking hot water from the top. So that is how this system works. We have a gas geyser and this system is totally automated. We also have a provision to change the position of the collector. To, uh, to maximum harnessing of solar energy, the position of collectors can be changed. This is, uh, of course, this is a manual one. Maybe two to three times it can be changed. Maybe towards in the morning it can be kept in the east. During uh, noon time it can be in the straight and eventually at the west side. Then we also have a 40 kg dryer. It is working based on aerating collectors, uh, temperature sensor, all those things. Then we have some small dryers of 5 kg. Then we have one household dryer model, about uh, 10 kg, uh, with the marine fluid it has been done. Then we also work on some novel drying techniques. Uh, now, in fact, we have an MOFA funded project on uh, development of continuous water drying system. What we are seeing here is a batch type infrared dryer. Here we have an infrared bulb. When the infrared bulb releasing its radiation in the infrared range, so what happens when this radiation comes and falling on your fluid product? It attacks the only water particles. When the water particles are attacked, there is a friction, vibration happens, then heat development occurs. Then immediately, due to vapor pressure difference, the water inside the product will come out. That is the advantage with the other solar dryer, for that matter, any mechanical dryer when we do it. The drying occurs from outside to inside. You have a hot air. The hot air has to move from surface to your internal so that it can remove the moisture. Whereas here, the radiation, the photons are directly going inside and attacking the water particles. So directly, the uh, water gets heated up. Due to vapor pressure difference, the moisture comes out. So that is how we are reducing the drying time. We are reducing the uh, uh, energy requirement. When we say a conventional dryer, say I want about uh, 1 kilowatt for this drying purpose, maybe 15 or 20 kg. Here I can say only 500 watts will be sufficient. Also, the color development, when we say for shrimp, when we dried it and we have seen, the color development is very good and the drying is very uniform. So this is also coming in a good way, but the only drawback is that uh, it is a batch type, so we can only keep one tray and there is a penetration depth. We cannot increase more than 25 centimeter. So we are uh, now presently working on a continuous system. Then we also have a low cost energy efficient walk-in type solar tunnel dryers. So this is meant for about 50 kg drying. We have this is a low cost one. In fact, it is a temporary structure which is made with PVC, CPVC and uh, GI uh, trays are there with SS mesh. So we have two fans, uh, then there are control systems. We also develop uh, permanent structures. So here, what we have seen in the previous slide is a polythene sheet, about 200 micron UV stabilized polythene sheet. Here, we are using a, 
a polycarbonate sheet. This also thickness varies. Uh, this is about 2 mm. So that, uh, as I was already uh, uh, told you, that we have given this type of dryers to what is the coastal region for the nutritional supplementation. There, there is a cyclone prone area. So immediately they want to uh, take out also. This 2 mm means this can be immediately uninstalled and it can be taken out. This structure will be as such. Only the sheet, poly polycarbonate sheet can be taken out. So here, this is a standalone dryer. We have a about 100 watts panel we have given. There are two DC fans. There is a control unit. It will um, um, mention how much temperature, what is the relative humidity, all those things. So this is about a somewhat a semi-permanent structure for a solar tunnel dryer. Then we also have a biomass dryer. In fact, those who are working in this uh, drying area knows that one drawback of this biomass dryer is that you cannot maintain the temperature. See, when you feed it more, you will get more heating. When the feeding is very less, you will have the very less temperature. But we have made one small intervention here. This, what you are seeing, this biomass furnace, there is a, the material can be fed inside, whatever wood or other fillers can be put inside. We have a small blower here. Okay. So whenever, when we put inside and close it and fire it, we will get sufficient temperature. When the set temperature, you have a controller here, when the drying air temperature is exceeding more than set temperature, say 60, the, that is the, conveyor, the message will go from here to the blower, the blower will stop. So the blower is not working, you will not get the heat there. Not the major blower which is working for dryer, I am talking about the blower which is kept for the purpose of furnace. So once it is fully fired, if burner is there, the blower is running, then only the hot air, more heat will be produced. So that can be controlled. So we have done that intervention now, now this is working fine. We can, uh, we only we have to feed it inside. We no need to be there always and check it. Maybe intermittently we have to open and check whether there is a fire wood or not. So what are the benefits of these dryers? This is a basically a green technology because it is a solar dryer that is supplemented with electrical LPG and other backup systems. Faster drying is possible. Uh, we can protect it against uh, the open sun drying, whatever drawbacks are there that can be taken uh, care here. Labor is saved. Quality is better in terms of nutrition, hygiene and color. It can be dried during even half sunshine hours. Uh, these materials are SS stainless steel. Then we also uh, develop this commercial model of dryers. Whatever I have shown, it is only 40, 50. In fact, we are also giving consultancy. We are developing about 250, 500 kg dryers and we are giving to the industry or the micro or small uh, fish processing units. Then we also done some comparison analysis in terms of energy, how much savings is there. Say we have a solar electrical dryer 20 kg, then that was compared with electrical alone. Then we found about cost and energy reduction of about 60 percent for 20 kg dryer, 40 kg dryer also similar range. Then LPG dryer we have about 45 to 50 percent reduction in energy and cost compared to LPG alone. Then we also regularly we have an incubation section. We do technology transfer. We also have a preparation of DPRs we used to give to the clients. Then for that purpose. When we have done it for this uh, uh, fill, uh, dry fish production, we found about uh, your BC ratio is about uh, uh, 1.23 and the payback period is about one and a half years. I think we have a technical session on DPR preparation, so it will be more clearer in that session. Uh, just I want to highlight our BC ratio is about always more than 1, 1.2 to 1.6. Our payback period is within one and a half to two years. Then this is about our uh, incubation uh, facility and the process. So we uh, basically client comes here, they visit, we demonstrate, we register them, we train them, especially for dry fish production. We have two to three days training program. People come there, get trained, then they get incubation here. So during incubation, we give DPR, we do uh, pilot plant facility, we give dryer, we give, we do networking and all those connections we used to give. Then they will do test marketing, they will commercialize. Eventually they will take up their own business. Then you can see these are all the dry fish brands which is available in the market with the help of CAFT. People have come to us, incubated. They used our facility. Eventually, they went out and taken the dryers and they are bringing out their in their own brands with their own FSA license. You can see there is a chef, chef and kitchen. This is like a micro fish processing unit. This guy is um, selling his dry fish all over Kerala. In fact, he is trying throughout the India also. Then these are all the local brands which are available in the market. Uh, this is only, uh, we have already for dry fish uh, incubation, we have about 40 members. These are some uh, reference things I am giving here. There are some more is there. Then you can also see different our training programs in this connection. 
uh, our different installations, trainings, uh, our own uh, demonstration things, you can see it. So these are all the training programs, installation fixtures. Also our descaling machines. Uh, initially I have seen this is meant for pre-processing operations. We are given to seafood industry. We are given to the uh, entrepreneurs. We also have a mobile fish vending unit, as Madam has clearly mentioned, for chilling purpose. Once fresh fish has to be sold in the market, people are selling in the open conditions. Retail shops also is kept open. So it is more front for contamination, flies, smell, all those things. So we have developed a refrigerated mobile fish vending kiosk. It is a hygienic selling of fish. There is a kiosk, you can see it here. The fish and the other uh, fishery products can be kept here. The temperature will be maintained about 2 to 3 degrees Celsius. Say when we uh, a small amount of ice to be added to avoid the dehydration, then this system can be kept for 2 to 3 days without spoilage. So this is also going good. We have given to Kerala Fisheries uh, Department about 20 numbers. In fact, now Cochin appeared under their CSR project. We are giving another uh, 60 numbers uh, throughout the Kerala. Then you can see some of the inauguration photos of our uh, dryer installed in different parts of the country. In fact, we have given to Northeast, uh, Odisha, Bhuvaneshwar, uh, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, uh, not only in Kerala. Then uh, this is uh, during our DG visit, we have uh, inaugurated uh, some of our dry fish products here. Then these are some of the inauguration photos. So we regularly conduct training. In fact, we have conducted one high tech training program. One of our uh, trainee he is from African National. He has seen our, uh, he was here, basically he was here in 2019. So he has seen our descaling machine. Then he has asked us some design drawings we have given him. Then he went back and then he has already made this and operate descaling machine and it is working good. He is very happy with this technology. Then this is a shop has already shown to you. This is our one of our incubator. And uh, this is very attractive design, you know, when we uh, there, when people go there for purchasing, they are tempted to purchase other materials also. It is very nicely as kept and it is going good. So with this, some of the photos of trainings, demonstrations, then some of the newspaper cuttings. With this, I am ending my presentation. Thank you one and all for kind attention. Thank you so much for providing in-depth detail on equipment and machinery, sir. Thank you.